beginning, right away, right away. Doubles is an aggressive game. The world famous teacher of the pros, Dennis Vandermeer, has taught millions of people to play tennis. Here at Hilton Head, South Carolina, and around the world, he has instructed more than 5,000 teaching professionals. I want to be sure that you are serving, coming in and volleying, and I want to be sure that you are returning, coming in my go. He teaches a standard method of tennis, which has become recognized worldwide and is a method in which 4,000 tennis teachers have been certified by the United States Professional Tennis Registry. No matter what your age or level of experience, his method of teaching and progressive steps will greatly improve your stroke production. This clear, basic approach enables players of all degrees to fine-tune their game and correct okay. nagging errors. Andy, I think that may be the solution to our problem, you know? The three tapes in this series, tape one, the basic game, tape two, the attacking game, and tape three, the tactical game, will give you the competitive edge. Hello, I'm Dennis Vandermeer, and on this tape, I'm going to show you how to use your serve as an attacking weapon. I'm going to show you a slice serve, I'm going to show you a topspin serve, I'm going to show you how to take the net, and then how you can use your volley to learn to put the ball away. And this is going to raise the level of your game one more notch higher. In chapter one, you're going to learn how to use your serve as an attacking weapon. In chapter two, I'm going to show you how to use your volley to learn to put the ball away. And also to correct the volley in case of any problems with the stroke. In chapter three, you can learn how to make a split step. That is an essential step you have to make when you come to the net. So you can position yourself to play the next point. In chapter four, you're going to learn how to return serve. If you can return serve, you can become a very effective tennis player. In chapter five, I'm going to show you how to use a backboard. This is going to be a very, very effective practice aid for you. Today, I'm going to use my serve as an attacking weapon. To many players, that means only one thing, blinding speed. Attack means hit the ball as hard as you can. And if you can make that tremendous ace, now you're attacking. The problem is this. It is not that reliable. And most people who use blinding speed as attack have to fall back on a second serve that quite often is very ineffectual. So if the blinding speed one doesn't go in, what do you do with number two? Well, you go a poopity poop. And that is a mediocre way to approach your tennis. I know people who've served thousands of balls and they very rarely get that big attacking serve in the court. I have a friend who may have served a, a million balls and this fellow has missed his first serve so many times that his second serve is really part of his first serve. He serves like this. He knows it's going to go out and then the second serve is part of it, you see. So he serves, boom, and then a poop. The two are really together as if he expects it to be an error. First serve, blunderbuss, second one, a poop. Once in a while, once every 5,000 times, he gets the first one in. First one only, first one only. <laughs> All right, you don't want to go through life having an unreliable serve just because you consider attack to mean speed. There's a lot more to it. There's slice, there's topspin, opening up the court. And I'll give you an example of how to use a slice serve, for instance. If I had a slice serve, look what I could do with the ball. If I can slice a serve to my opponent's forehand, look what, where my opponent ends up. The court is wide open and I can make a winning shot cross court. Now that is one use of a slice serve to open up the court for me. Another very advantageous use would be to serve the ball down the middle of the court and to have the ball curve with a slice into my opponent's body. That jams my opponent and again it elicits a weak return. So here would be an example of jamming my opponent.
see the ball jam my opponent's body, giving me an easy shot to play down the line. Now that's the effect of a slice serve. What about a spin serve? A top spin serve. Now look what a top spin serve does. When I serve a top spin, look how high the ball rebounds. Now, the effect of this particular serve is not only does it give a high rebound that makes it difficult for my opponent to play aggressively, it has three other benefits. Now, I've got this high kicking serve. My opponent has a problem in returning the ball. The next benefit of it would be this. When I serve the ball high over the net, look what happens. I have no fear that the ball will go in the net. I can clear the net by a substantial margin and there will be no problem at all. The next benefit will be this. If I serve the spin serve, I can at the same time, because the ball is slower to the air, I can come to net. It gives me tons of time to come to net and make a winning volley. And the fourth advantage of this particular serve would be I can use it as a surprise element. My opponent doesn't know what's coming and I can surprise it, my opponent by serving, by changing my toss, my opponent not being able to pick it up and serving the ball into his body as a surprise, again getting a weak return from my opponent. I'm going to use this huge tennis ball as a prop, as an example how one could learn the slice serve. Now, if you could imagine a clock face, if you could imagine this is 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 9 o'clock and 6 o'clock. Now, as I turn it around, I can see 3 o'clock from this side. If my racket would move from my left to my right and I would bypass the ball towards 3 o'clock, this bypassing motion would give me the spin of the ball that will make the ball pull my opponent way out of court or jam my opponent. And that is the principle of the slice, this bypassing motion. Now, I've shown this to a lot of people and people who have played tennis for some time and have not been able to master this slice as it can't be learned. It's not true. I'm going to show you a trick how today you could actually learn a slice serve. If you follow a set of simple progressions, you could learn a slice serve today. First thing is to get the grip. Now, uh, instead of using your normal grip, choke the racket a little bit. Go to an extreme service grip from your forehand, go pretty far over, and that will give you the right grip to learn the slice. Now, once you've got the right grip, take the ball. Of course, it's not as easy as with a huge ball, but we'll manage. Take your racket and just put it behind your back like this. And now visualize the bypassing motion from your left to your right, bypassing the ball. And this bypassing motion essentially is the slice movement. I hold my racket behind my back and I bypass the ball. It's like a, like a paper tearing sound. Now, you add the follow through to it. And there you have the slice serve. Now you add the backswing, give it some continuity. So choking it, backswing, slice serve. And now you hold the racket full length, and here you have a complete slice. Using basically the same information, you could also learn the twist serve. Again, using the huge ball, a clock face example, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 9 o'clock, and 6 o'clock. But this time, instead of bypassing at 3 o'clock, 
as we did in the slice, now we are going to bypass at one o'clock. And this one o'clock bypass will give the ball the rotation that will give it top spin. Now, using a real live ball, let's go through the same steps of progression. Choke the racket, use an extreme backhand grip, put the racket behind your back, and now the racket's gonna go towards one o'clock and bypass by the ball using the wrist. And there you have the picture of a topspin serve. Now, add the follow through to it. Hold the racket behind your back, use your wrist bypass, and finish in front of your body. Now add the backswing for continuity. And there you have the twist serve. Now hold the racket full length, still with the extreme grip. And there you have not only the complete serve, but holding at full length, it starts to give you more kick and more carry on the ball. Now, I've not talked much about the toss. When you do uh, serve a slice, the ball, sure, is tossed a little bit more towards your right-hand side. When you serve a twist serve, the toss is a bit more towards your left. But don't exaggerate the toss too much, because if you exaggerate it, You'll be able to get the spins, but you are also, in essence, giving your opponent uh, the message. Hey, it's going to be a slice. Hey, it's going to be a top spin. And there is no disguise and no surprise. So keep the toss kind of in the same place, and rather that your wrist do the variations for you. So once you've mastered the slice serve and the top spin serve, you've built your attacking game to complement your volley. A lot of people feel that the volley should be number one again, speed, blinding speed. And that again is not the concept. Remember, when you are close to the net, you are increasing your chances to direct the ball. The closer I'm the net, the sharper the angles can be. So uh, speed is not that relevant. I don't need speed all the time. Also, if I am close to the net, I can direct the ball with depth. And those are the considerations for a volley, not the blinding speed ones. Now I'm going to show you a few suggestions how one could work on the volley. Now here is a picture of the forehand volley and the backhand volley. The forehand volley. And here we we'll, we'll just rally out a few balls so you can see what the volley would look like. You can see there's almost no backswing. My racket is ready. A volley. Now the same on the back end. Now a forehand volley again. The key was not to swing at the ball. If you make a mistake, two things happen. The player either uses a lot of swing, produces power, you don't really know where it goes. Or some players are so tricky, they have this tricky little wristy stuff. All these things reduce the consistency of the volley. What you would basically like to do is this. You want to set your racket. You want to set your racket and play the ball very firmly. From this position here, look, you can make a winning shot to that side of the court over there. You can make a winning shot over there. No need to go for that huge wind-up and the speed that's so satisfying to many of us. I'll give you an example of how precise the volley could be. If you had, for instance, a, a paper cup, I'll show you how accurate you should be. You should be able to hold a paper cup in your hand and put the ball right in the mouth of this paper cup. That's what you'd be able to do with a ball. Now, if you can do that, you can see how easy it would be to volley without mistake. You put the paper cup behind your racket like this, right in the mouth of the paper cup. None. 
Then you remove the paper cup, and now you volley without any mistake at all. The forehand volley. And the same will apply to backhand. Just set your racket and punch the ball. Of course, on the forehand side, you held the racket, or the forehand grip, as if you are shaking hands with it. That would be the ideal way to volley initially. On the backhand side, you should change your grip. Turn your hand a little bit over, get more support behind uh, the back of your hand, behind the back of the racket, and now you're ready to play a firm backhand. Many good players, players who play a lot of tennis, they use a, a continental grip, an in-between grip, where they don't have to make a big change from forehand to backhand. The problem is this, that many people who attempt that don't have the experience with the ball to accomplish a, an effective stroke. If you don't have a firm grip, if you don't have the strength of a tournament player, you can make a weak shot both on the forehand and the backhand side. So tournament players have a trick. When the ball comes to the forehand side, they use the in-between grip. When it comes to the backhand side, they've got so much control over the arm, they can actually just change the extensor muscle. So they can make, just by changing the forearm, they can make a forehand or a backhand. So unless you have this uh, facility, you should change your grip. Sure, sometimes the ball comes too fast and you may forget, but most of the time you're able to get your racket set properly and make a nice firm volley on the backhand side and the forehand side. So those are the, the basics of good volleys. Remember, when the ball comes low, don't drop the racket. The ball comes low, bend your knees and get down for the low volleys. And when the ball comes high, that's your chance to make a winning shot. But at the same time, be careful. High volleys are known as easy volleys. Why do you think they call them easy? They're easy to miss. Pay attention, you get a high one, there's nothing worse in the world. Oh. <sighs> it happens, don't. When there's a high one, pay attention and put it away and be sure you don't make a mistake. Those are the ingredients of good volleys. Now, let's look at some problems in the volley and how you could correct it. So you saw that the volley is the easiest shot in tennis. Just set your racket up and meet the ball. Backhand side, set your racket up and meet the ball. But, you know, some people don't listen. They say, well, that's too easy. We want it more difficult for ourselves. And I'll show you some ways you can make it more difficult for yourself. The first way is to use your wrist. If you try a volley like this, you will be known as that hard-hitting player. You'll also be known as that inconsistent player. See, when you use your wrist, you have a very short radius, and the slightest misjudgment will send the ball off at a very large tangent, you see. So what you want to do is increase the radius by some stability. Now, I showed you a correction on the uh, forehand drive where you can fix your loose wrist. Similarly, you can do it on a volley. Choke your racket, and this will immediately make it apparent to you that you are losing your wrist. You can see right away there was a loose wrist there. Keep the butt of the racket out in front of your elbow, or rather your forearm, out in front of your forearm. And there you have stability. Now, hold the racket full length, and you'll be amazed how much more effective your body is going to be just because you have increased the stability fighting through the ball and by not hitting across the ball by breaking your wrist. Now that's one correction. Another very common mistake would be when the ball is low. A lot of people don't like to bend their knees. And you'll see typically that this would be the volley for a low shot. What's going to be the end result? The minute you drop your racket down like this for a low ball, the ball's going to go out. The way to do it is, to learn it, is to bend your knees. And I'm going to show you an exaggeration. If you would do this, actually sit down on the ground. Sit down like this, set your racket, and you're in for a very big surprise. The solidity of this stroke, it feels so solid when you sit down like this. That is how you play a low shot. See? Now when the ball is fed to you from the other side, quickly sit down and actually touch your knees. Go to an exaggerated pose. And then later on, you don't have to exaggerate anymore. Now you just bend as deeply as you have to. If you think of your knees as being elevators, that you can play the higher ones from up here, then the elevator takes you down to the ground floor. And if you can learn to bend, 
you're going to be a very much more effective volleyer. The next mistake, very common mistake, is the player who swings on the volley. Ball comes. A lot of power. You know, people kind of get this, this crazy looking glint in their eye. Kill, kill. No, man, up at net. Rather have be the finesse player. Rather be somebody who finesses. So how do you avoid swinging like crazy? One way would be uh, to imagine you're a monkey in a cage. Just hold the racket out in front like this. <laughs> and you may not take the racket back. Just keep it out in front here. You're like a monkey in a cage. And now, with one hand, just keep your racket here. And right away, you've eliminated the, the big backswing. Uh, I'll show you another way how you could make a similar correction because this is such a popular mistake. Let me show you another way how you could help yourself to learn how to swing back. Now here's the, the prop that's going to help you cure your big back swings on the volley. Stand close to the back fence and play a volley. And you can see that we as tennis pros love you to play like this because as you hit the back fence here, the middle post here, you're going to buy a lot of rackets. Instead of that, cure yourself. Don't have a backswing. Set your racket in front of the, the fence and say, look, I'm not going to swing back and go out and attack the ball. Now, at first, you may feel you don't have much strength, but the, the more times you go against the ball, you'll find you'll be able to generate power without a backswing. And that is how quickly you could cure yourself from the problem of swinging back and wailing at the ball. I'll show you another mistake that a lot of my pupils make, is I'm encouraging them to play the net but they're not used to it, you see. So I say, practice playing the net. Yes, Dennis, I, I promise to play the net. So they come to the net, and I give them a volley, you see. And then I, I'm not watching them. Next thing I see, and then another next ball comes, another step back, and next ball comes. I say, no, come forward again, you see. And they come forward, and they run back away. And after every four or five balls, they are on the service line. They keep backing up. Now, I want to show you a trick. If you are one of those players who does not feel comfortable playing the net and you keep running away, here's a foolproof way to correct that problem. You need just a little piece of ribbon and you tie this ribbon to the net. And now you tie the ribbon to your racket and now look what happens. Now if you're the person who has been running away from the net, let's see you run away now. There is no way you can back up now. You are stuck. You are stuck right here and you're going to get used to playing very effectively from the net. This is the way you would make yourself be an aggressive net player and not back up on deep shots. I want to show you one other volley correction and this one relates particularly to the backhand side. Now many of you are using a two-handed backhand. Now there's nothing wrong with a two-handed backhand but there are different grips. If you are using a two-handed backhand with a forehand grip and the left hand supporting it, you'll have a great deal of difficulty volleying when the ball is close to your body. Look what happens. With this grip, I can volley very successfully over here. But when the ball comes close to my body, I have to let go. And look what a lumpy shot this is. There's just no way I can play the ball from here because I have no power. What I recommend you do is this. Use your two-handed stroke, but when you come to net, practice changing your grip. Then you can volley with two hands when the ball is out of your reach. But then when the ball comes close to your body, you can let go and you can play a very effective stroke with one hand. So please, I want you to become a good net player. You cannot play the net well with this kind of a, a system of, of grips. You have to have a backhand grip so you can defend yourself when the ball comes close to your body. If you learn this, you're going to be a very popular doubles partner. When you've learned to volley, you should also work on your footwork. Now sometimes the ball comes so fast, you can't move your feet at all. The ball comes quickly. Just set your racket and play the ball. Sit and play. If you have a bit more time, maybe you want to take a step with your right foot. I take my right foot and I step across and punch the ball. That may be all you have time for. Or if the ball were to be further out of your reach, I may have to step with my left foot. Left foot to step across and punch the ball. The ball may be so far out of your reach, you may have to take two steps. Right foot, left foot. The other possibility could be this. The ball could come right at your body. Now look what I'm going to do. I take my left foot and I step away. That's how I position myself. Now, say if the ball came right at my body 
but I want to buy myself a bit of time, maybe a tenth of a second. Look what I'm doing now. I step back, and that gives me perhaps another tenth of a second. That's all you need. The last stroke on the forehand would be to step into the ball. Set my racket, step in, and make a winning shot. That's all. Those are all the possibilities. If you would practice these possibilities, on the forehand side, the backhand side, the same stuff, by the way, same stuff, backhand, do nothing. Take one step, do a crossover step, take two steps, step away from the ball, buy yourself some time, step in and win the points. Those are all the possibilities. Practice those things. Do them as shadow drills to get your feet moving at your racket set. If you were to practice these little footwork suggestions and these racket suggestions, you will be amazed how much your volley will improve in real match play situations. How do I get to the net? Sure, I can volley. I know I can serve. Here's a problem a lot of players have faced. And they wonder why they get passed. Look what happens. I got passed. The problem is, I kept rushing the net. And I couldn't set myself to go to the right or to the left. Good players know that when you come to net, you have to watch your opponent. And as your opponent is about to make the return, you split your feet. And splitting your feet like this gives you a chance to move either to your forehand side or to your backhand side, or if the ball is short, to move in against the ball, or if your opponent loves the ball, to move back. So it's a real essential to add a split step to your game. If you have a split step, coming the net presents no problem. So have a look what it looks like with a split step. Split. I could move to the ball, presented no problem whatsoever for me. Now that's great, but look what happens quite often in the game. What happens is, when I've made the split step, and we'll just repeat the same again. What happens is, when I've made the split step, sure, I make a good first volley. Now look where I am now. I'm over here, and now look what happens. My opponent runs down the ball, and now I get passed. The keys, I should move in, cut off the angle, and now I can close in and put the ball away. And by doing this, using my serve as an attacking weapon, coming to net, splitting, setting up for my opponent's return, moving in, either winning the point outright or setting myself up for the close and putting the ball away, I fulfilled all the functions of an attacking player. Today, I'm going to show you how to return serve. The most critical stroke in tennis. Whenever you see winners and losers, the winners are the people who can return serve. What are the ingredients of a good return of serve? I'll show you the typical things that you have to do to become consistent as a returner. Of course, initially you will just be sure you have a good base, you have the grip of your choice, you're alert. And now comes 
the most important move you will make. Look what I'm going to do now. The first move I made was a quick shoulder turn. That is the key. If you can make a quick shoulder turn, you've got the base of a good return of serve. People who play poorly, they do this. They move the racket without turning sideways. It means you're going to push at the ball. The key is a shoulder turn. Turn the shoulder. Once I made the shoulder turn, it's very easy. Now it's easy. How soon do I turn the shoulders? That is the important thing. Now, depending on my experience, as soon as my opponent hits the ball, within 10, 15, 20 feet, I should have picked up with my eyes where the ball is going to come to my forehand or backhand. And if it comes to my forehand, I'll be ready for it. If the ball comes to my backhand, I'll be ready for it. The earlier I can see it, the better a player I'm going to be. Now, the next time you watch tournament players, have a look and see what their reaction is when the opponent has hit the ball in the net. Look what you will see. Ah, a backhand. What happened? My opponent served the ball in the net. But while the ball was traveling towards me, my eye picked the direction of the ball. And right away, I made my shoulder turn. Good players, players like McEnroe, Lendl, Wielander, uh, Martina Navratilova, Chrissy Evert, those players. What makes them great is the fact that they are capable of seeing that ball so very, very early, immediately after the hit. Inexperienced players have much more difficulty in judging the ball. And they, they look like this. Ball. Double fault, thank heavens. Sure, why thank heavens? Because they never saw the ball. The ball hit the net and they never responded. If the same ball had come over the net, the play would have been so late, it would have made for a very rushed kind of return of serve. That's why people have these weird looking returns of serve, because they don't have that initial shoulder turn. So, that was the most important first move, is to turn your shoulders. Now, I need to discuss this in a little bit more detail for you. When I turn my shoulders, look how it's connected to my foot. The two go together. As I turn, it moves as a unit the foot and the shoulder. The foot and the shoulder, they go together. And now I'm ready. Now from here, I take my racket back, not in the normal fashion of a full backswing. It has to be more compact because return of serve, the ball is coming much quicker. I keep my elbow in quite close and I set my racket almost parallel to the ground. A very Short preparation. Step, shoulder turn, and simultaneously, almost as one movement, a preparation of my racket. Now I'm ready. Now most likely, all I have to do at this stage is just to step into the ball. One step in to stroke the ball. If that were to happen, I would have been perfectly balanced to return the serve. Ready position, foot and shoulder, racket ready. Foot and shoulder, racket ready, and return the ball. Now that is one kind of return. Of course, if the ball comes a little bit slower, I may decide to take my racket back a little bit further and play a little bit of lift. Turn, a little bit slower. Have a bit more backswing and lift a little bit more. 
That would be another possibility. If my opponent were to serve the ball that bounced a bit higher, I may decide to do a bit of a slice. I may slice the ball a little bit. And these are variations. If my opponent gives me a short ball, I may decide to move in against it and attack. And there you have a typical example of how the receiver can become the aggressor. I took the ball early, I sliced the ball back deep, got the net, and had a chance to put the ball away. Now, it's important that you see the footwork that I used to get the net. Have a look and see whether you can see how I maneuvered myself to attack uh, the short serve. You can see my feet never stopped. I constantly was on the run. Now, uh, many people cannot make this uh, attacking return of serve because what they try to do is they try to stop and then hit. It looks like this. Very jerky and it doesn't give you enough momentum towards the net. You get caught halfway and you get passed. The trick is to hit the ball on the run. Be balanced. So it is a dynamic balance. You're in motion while you hit the ball. That would be the footwork. Um, have a look and see that I'm really hitting the ball off my right foot. Now, this is contrary to uh, what we normally would teach. Normally, we would teach to step into the ball. But when you make this uh, attacking uh, return of serve, it's played off the right foot. Let me show you one more time. And that is the footwork you would use to take yourself to the net. Now, there are some other returns of serve. You have seen, uh, at the moment, it's very popular. Some of the players who hit very heavy topspin, they wail away at the return of serve. And before you try to imitate these players, realize that they have great wrist control. They have quickness of the racket head. If you don't have that, you're going to be too late with your heavy topspin. So this would be a return of serve using topspin. I have to be very, very quick because if my racket isn't properly aligned with the ball, I'm going to get a very unreliable return. So those of you with topspin returns, try to make the swing a bit shorter than normal and you have to use a little bit more wrist than you would on your normal ground stroke. That would be the way in which you could return a topspin. Now here is, on the forehand side, one of the most important maneuvers uh, that all good players have mastered. And that is to step around the weak shot. Whenever you see a good player attacking a weak serve, it's normally on a second serve directed to the backhand and the good player having stepped around the ball and playing a forehand drive. So here is a footwork sequence that you should really try and master. The ball is coming to my backhand side. Now watch me return the ball uh, down the line. I moved clear across the court. I read the direction of the ball. As a matter of fact, I anticipated that a little bit. It's quite often and quite common for the uh, server to direct the second ball to my backhand side. So I figured it out. I said, he is going to serve to my backhand. And as he tossed the ball up, I took a bit of a chance. I started to move around the ball, and on my forehand side, 
I could play very aggressively down the line or cross court. Look at the stroke one more time and then I'll describe it a bit in detail. So let's have a look. Our opening move always on return of serve ought to be pivot onto the right foot and shoulder turn. But when you decide that you're going to run around the ball, then you have to use a different set of footwork. The footwork now would be the initial pivot would be to go by stepping backwards with your right foot. You pivot on the balls of your left foot onto your right foot. So this becomes your opening move, left, right. And from here, once you've done this, you can move as many steps as necessary to get around the ball. Traditionally, I would pivot by stepping with my right foot and turning my shoulders. But now, when I decide I'm going to run around the ball, my first move is to pivot by stepping away with my right foot behind my left foot and now take as many steps as is necessary to get in a position to play the ball. So this is one of the most important weapons that the good returner has at his disposal. Now let's discuss uh, where are you going to play the ball to? Uh, what are you going to do with the ball? Many people just think as a return of service to hit the ball as hard as you can. Preferably direct the ball. Here are your choices. You can either hit the ball down the line, you can hit the ball cross court, you can play a short angle cross court, When your opponent is coming to the net, what would be a good return? If somebody is crowding the net, a neglected return is the lob. If my opponent serves and runs the net, obviously this is going to give me a very good chance to win the point. It's so simple. But you think, when was the last time that you lob the ball over the net rusher's head. Now, those are all the varieties of returns on serve that you would have. And what you should do is be sure that you are versatile. Don't just have one kind of return. Mix it up. Use your return of serve to best suit the circumstances at hand. Now let's go to the backhand side and go and discuss how to return backhands. The backhand return of serve. There are many similarities between the forehand return of serve and the backhand return of serve. Then of course, there are a few particular differences. The most important one is this, the grip. If you have a forehand grip and you try to return the ball on the backhand side, it just no way is going to work. That ball could be coming 100 miles an hour. The racket will just collapse in your hand. You must support the grip with a strong hand. And the way you do it is to turn your hand and get some support behind the racket. Now when the ball comes quickly, you are strong and you can withhold and withstand the shock of this fast approaching ball. You have the right grip. Now let's look at some of the similarities. First thing you do when you see the ball coming is you pivot. On the forehand side, the pivot was with the right foot. On the backhand side, the pivot's with the left foot. As you turn your shoulders, you pivot with your left foot and you set your racket. You set your racket to be ready for the ball. And now as the ball comes at you, all you have to do is go against the ball and a backhand return of serve is no longer as big a problem as you thought it was going to be. Backhand grip, pivot, set your racket, adjust your feet and finish the stroke. 
And this is the basic backhand return of serve. Of course, on the backhand side, there are other returns as well. You could try a topspin return of serve. Same as on the forehand side, a little bit more racket motion, so be careful. A very effective shot, but because there's more racket motion, the chance of error is a little bit greater. So prepare quickly, be on the ball very fast, and play through the ball. Now, the next stroke is the lob. Now, remember how effective we found this on the forehand side. The opponent came in, and we just popped the lob over the uh, net rusher's head. On the backhand side, exactly the same thing. All you do when the player comes in is just pivot, set your racket, open the racket face, and over the net rusher's head. And now you've got another very special shot on the backhand side. When you've lobbed the opponent a few times, look what's going to happen. The opponent becomes gun shy. Instead of rushing, towards the net, they kind of come in halfway. The opponent will come in halfway, anticipating a lob. Now, as soon as they start to lag a bit like this, if you had a, a slice backhand return, you could put it low at his feet, and maybe have a chance to make an easy passing shot. And there you have the slice backhand return. Now, all the strokes on the backhand side have been done with a well-set grip and with a pivot, footwork, and a follow-through. But here is one very special shot you should know about. And that is how to handle the situation when you have an opponent who bounces the ball high and the ball is kicked up way up here. How do you handle that stroke? I'll demonstrate a few times for you, and I'll describe for you how to learn it. The high kicking stroke on your backhand side. Now, have a look and see what I'm doing. First thing I was doing was I set my racket. I set my racket, and now Watch my feet. Because the ball is bouncing so high, I need to slide my back foot up to adjust for the bounce of the ball. And this is the way I go against the ball to counteract this high bouncing kick. So, Let's review the backhand return of serve one more time. A backhand grip, a shoulder turn with a pivot on the left foot, the racket set, and then when the ball comes, just go against the ball. And if you have mastered these two strokes, the forehand return of serve and the backhand return of serve, you've got the basis for a winning game. Now let's have a look at a two-handed backhand return of serve. You can see the technique is quite different from that of a one-handed backhand return. Have a look and see how the two hands hang on to the racket for the last minute and have a look how the hips open on the backhand. If you have a practice partner, that's of course ideal. But if you don't have a practice partner, a backboard or a wall anywhere can really help you to improve your tennis. 
It's one of the best ways to practice. And yet, it can also be one of the worst ways. I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. If you go to a backboard or a wall and you start hitting the ball uncontrolled and the ball beats you, you are just practicing how to be a lousy player. Now, no benefits come out of this. The best way to do it is to start off with control. Very lightly hit controlled little shots. No backspin at all, just tap, tap the ball. Keep your feet moving and try to get a kind of a, a feeling for the rhythm of the, of the ball. Now, once you feel comfortable on the forehand side that you can tap, tap, by the way, if the ball beats you again, if you get behind, stop right away, stop the rally, get yourself together again, and start with the tap, tap, taps again. Once you're comfortable on the forehand side, change to a backhand, and now do some backhand tappity taps. Always moving your feet, be on balance, and now practice grip changes, forehand, and I'll switch to a backhand, a lot of footwork. So you can get a good workout here, practicing your strokes from a very short distance from the backboard. Once you're comfortable here, now move further back. And I can play full length strokes. At this stage, what would be preferable would be to let the ball bounce twice. If you let the ball bounce twice, you have enough time to complete every stroke and get ready for the next shot. Forehand drives. And also the same for your backhand drive. A lot of footwork always. Now when you feel comfortable that you have got the strokes grooved, you can start practicing alternates. All right. And a forehand drive and a backhand drive. Now if you want to take the ball earlier, this would be more as if you are returning serve or as when you are playing an attacking shot. Now only one bounce, very quick preparation, short preparation, and attack the ball. The other stroke that you can very effectively learn against the backboard and improve is your volley. Now, you should start off slowly. Do it relatively high, because the ball will be quite slow then. Pop the ball quite high at first. Just slowly pop it up, gradually reduce the height, until you get control over the ball. Now, you can also switch to your backhand side and do backhand. Now, get a bit trickier. Change from forehand to backhand. And as you get better at it, boom, you can increase the pace and really work a bit on your reaction. Quick reaction, boom, boom, right, like in a fast match. Of course, a good tennis player not only has speed, a good tennis player also has finesse and touch. And here's that ideal way to learn this finesse and touch. Here's an example of, of touch. That's what touch would look like. The other stroke that you could pass against the backboard would be the overhead smash. You hit the ball against the, the backboard and it'll ricochet upwards. Watch. Up and it ricochets up in the air. Now, if I want an easy one, I just tap the ball lightly. And here's an easy overhead. Now, if I'd like to make it more difficult for myself, I can give the ball a bit more pace. It bounces higher and I have to jump to reach the ball. So, you can see how versatile the backboard would be. The other exercise you could do is one that will help you very much when you play a match. And that is when the ball goes over your head. Look what happens. The ball goes over my head. It's no problem. I run backwards and I get the ball. Now if you practice this, you will lose your fear of running backwards for a ball over your head. And there you have a backhand drive when the ball is going over your head. Another stroke you could practice very effectively would be your serve. You don't need a tennis court to practice accuracy. If you would go to the net, rather to the backboard, you have a simulated net height, and you were to draw a square or a circle, 
And now from the net to the baseline will be 39 feet, 13 steps. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Amazing, right here. Now look what would happen. If I could serve the ball into that square over there, that would be exactly the same as if I were on a court and would serve the ball into the service court, directing the ball either to my opponent's forehand or to my opponent's backhand. So it's absolutely the same simulation. Now, a serve towards the service square. And there you have it. If I can put the ball right in that square there, that means it will also go in the court when I'm playing a real match. So you don't need a tennis court. As a matter of fact, you can have a complete match just by yourself against the backboard and combine all the strokes. Ready backboard? Okay. Play. A serve. A return of serve. Moving. A forehand attack. Backhand half volley. Forehand half volley. Closing volley. Low volley. Bend the knee. Over the head. Go back. Get the ball. Moving again. Half volley. Moving again. Volley. Down the line. Volley. Opponent loves again. It's a love and it's a, a put away. And that is how you can use a backboard to raise the level of your game. Man's best friend, the backboard. Now I've shown you how to use a serve as an attacking weapon. How to use your volley as a put away shot. In the next tape, I'm going to show you some specialty shots as well. Overhead smash, topspin lob, drop shot and how to use all these strokes and to use them tactically in singles and in doubles for a winning game.